thank you very much for that introduction. I, I'm assuming you can hear me and see my see my slide. Um, thank you very much to Charlene and her lovely paper and their beautiful illustrations. Um, I knew that there'd be lots of lovely illustrations in this conference and Thomas Love Peacock doesn't seem to be very well represented in the digital archives. So I went along to the Wordsworth Museum in Grasmere last week and created my own digital archive of um, pages from the first edition of Thomas Love Peacock's novel, Melincourt, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So in Thomas Love Peacock's novel, uh, Melincourt, published in 1817, we meet Sir Oran Auton, a mute but cultured and chivalrous gentleman, a landowner, a musician, a rescuer of damsels in distress, a prospective member of parliament and an orangutan. The book has a plot of sorts, and Thelia Melincourt, a wealthy young heiress in want of a husband, meets Sylvan Forrester. Sir Anne Auton's friend, an idealistic man of property with opinions on many subjects. The marriage plot is foiled by a number of events, a road trip connected with a parliamentary election, the kidnap and rescue of Anthalia twice, the machinations of other suitors and matchmakers, and satirical encounters with barely disguised romantic poets such as Coleridge, Wordsworth and Southey. The book engages through satire with a number of contemporary political, economic and social controversies. But in this paper, I focus on Peacock's representation of natural history and how he satirises and complicates the reader's relationship with it. The orangutan of the early 19th century imagination does not resemble the animal we might encounter today in Borneo or Sumatra the creature with reddish hair and long arms. This is a different creature. He is tall, he walks erect, he has a gentle nature. He is known as a pongo in Angola and an orangutan in South America. And for the avoidance of doubt, and this image here, the, the orangutan is the, the bottom, at the bottom of the picture. From early in the novel, the reader is in on the joke that Sir Oran is an orangutan dressed as a wealthy man with excellent table manners, a taste for good wine, although he's a little unpredictable at times. He can play the flute, but is incapable of speech. The other characters in the novel are unaware of his status as a non-human primate, but despite being polite and chivalrous and appearing to fit into upper-class society, aping their manners, as one reviewer wittily put it, he makes people feel uncomfortable. People describe him as ludicrous, singular, extraordinary, the dumb baronet, the ugly monster. He is very tall and disturbingly strong. Sylvan Forrester introduces his friend, Sir Telegraph Paxaret, to Sir Aram Auton, and the three having dined together, describes Sir Aram's background and origins. Briefly, Forrester has acquired him from a sea captain who in turn bought him from the, Afri from the African family who had previously owned him. He has introduced him to English society, bought him a baronetcy and has arranged for him to be elected to Parliament. You can see the kind of things that Peacock was satirising. So Telegraph poses a question. Do you really think him one of us? Forrester responds, I really think him a variety of the human species. And this is a point which I have it much at heart to establish in the acknowledgement of the civilised world. So Telegraph contradicts him. Buffon, whom I dip into now and then in the winter, ranks him with Linnaeus in the class of Simeon. According to the chapter's many footnotes, Forrester's source of knowledge about the orangutan status derives primarily from a book written by James Burnett, Lord Monboddo, called The Origin and Progress of Language in 1774. Monboddo was a Scottish anthropologist and judge, ridiculed by contemporaries for his eccentricity and dubious scientific methods. So Telegraph's response to Forrester's claiming him for the human species cites Le Comte de Buffon and Linnaeus, both respected and important natural philosophers. His self-deprecating reference to dipping into Buffon now and again in the winter, 
underlines the substantial nature of Buffon's great work, Histoire naturelle générale et particulière, which by 1808 had run to 127 volumes and his own engagement with it. His confident statement about Buffon's ranking of the orangutan in the class of simiae speaks to his familiarity with the work and ability to recall it accurately. Scientific discoveries and texts are closely linked with the spread of education, increased literacy, a flourishing publishing industry, new institutions, and a significant increase in public interest for knowledge and information. Sharon Rustin described the writers of the Romantic period as having, quote, a sophisticated understanding of scientific knowledge, a complex engagement with it, as well as critique and challenge, end of quote. Peacock displays these attributes in Melincourt and implies similar levels of understanding in his readers, expecting them to understand his references to Monbodo, Buffon and Linnaeus, and appreciate his satirical deployment of their ideas. One review of the novel captures this mingling of edification and satire. Quote, the author has displayed his erudite powers and indulged a vein of satire, or so we are apt to think of it on Buffon, Lord Mimbodo, and the author of the ancient metaphysics. Melincourt illustrates the degree to which a popular understanding of natural history was central to literary life and accessible to Peacock's likely readership. Within this framework of knowledge, Peacock satirizes Forrester's theories, making their embodiment in the form of Sir Aran appear ridiculous. Conversely, Sir Telegraph's interest in reading science for pleasure and his reliance on more authoritative sources of knowledge enabled his gentle challenges to Forrester. So Telegraph's habit of dipping into Buffon shows that he reads natural history texts for pleasure would have come as no surprise to Peacock's readers. Noah Herringman, editor of Romantic Science, The Literary Forms of Natural History, confirms this contemporary interest in the form, writing, and quote, the rapid expansion of print culture beginning in the, late, in the later 18th century fueled the circulation of writings famously obsessed with nature, from romantic poems and scenic tours to theories of the picturesque or the deluge, to the persistent and polymathic genres of natural history. These kinds of writings shared a common readership, end, end of quote. It is tempting to speculate that Herringman had Melincourt in mind when he wrote this, since all of the forms of nature writing that he cites make an appearance in the novel at some point. Peacock makes particular use of these polymathic genres of natural history as he brings into focus the contrasts between the theories and interpretations of armchair anthropologist Lord Monbodo and highly respected naturalist Buffon. Other critics have also drawn attention to the preponderance of science and history texts and natural history texts in the period and their influence on literary output. And William Sinclair includes a consideration of science texts and his important work on the reading habits of people in the Romantic period, reflecting on their interest for readers and to their value in the dissemination of knowledge. Contemporary magazines and journals contained articles on the latest discoveries in natural history, science or technology, alongside reviews of poetry and novels, accounts of foreign travel, political tracts and religious debates. The Conde de Buffon study of natural history, which eventually ran to 127 volumes, appeared in France between 1749 and 1767. Ludmilla Jordanova describes the work as not only a huge compendium of the natural world written by a prominent and powerful French savant, but a work widely read and appreciated for its literary elegance. One translator of the work into English, uh, John Smith Barr, recognized this popularity with a diverse range of readers as he wrote in his preface, we should certainly be guilty of a gross absurdity if in an age like the present, we were to enter into an elaborate discussion on the advantages to be derived from the study of natural history the ancients recommended it as useful, instructive and entertaining. And the moderns have so far pursued and cultivated this first of sciences that it is now admitted to be the source of universal instruction and knowledge. 
where every active mind may find subjects to amuse and delight, and the artist a never failing field to enrich his glowing imagination. Barr claimed that there was no need to justify studying natural history. The subject had long been considered useful, instructive and entertaining and was now regarded as fundamental to knowledge, appealing to every active mind. He situates Buffon's work as accessible to all for education, entertainment, pleasure and food for the imagination. Poets, writers and artists such as Percy and Mary Shelley, John Keats, William Blake and Oliver Goldsmith were among those influenced by Buffon. Peacock also participated in this engagement with science knowledge. Living in Marlow in the hot summer of 1818, he recorded in his journal, digressed, uh, he was reading Greek mythology at the time, digressed to read Histoire du Signe, the cry of the swan described in the notes, I heard myself from my old friend Tom below the bridge. This was Buffon's account of the swan, and Tom was evidently Peacock's name for a particular swan on the River Thames. He, he was also dipping into the greatly expanded edition of Histoire Naturelle, published between 1799 and 1810, and he mentioned it several more times in his journal that summer. It's interesting that he was also relating it to his own observation of the natural world. I'm trying to... I can't... That's better. Peacock engages in Melincourt with Lord Monboddo's theories regarding the boundary between the human and the non-human and what constitutes humanity, a prominent romantic period concern. In his account of Sir Oran's origins and history, Forrester tells the Telegraph that some presu presumptuous naturalists have refused his species the honour of humanity, but the most enlightened and illustrious philosophers agree in considering him in his true light as the natural and original man. You can't see the asterisk in, in my image, but this statement gives rise to an enormous footnote between pages 68 and 69 of the book, as you can see, and it also spills over into page 70 and occupies half of that page too. The footnotes are mainly extracts from Mombodo, supporting Forrester's view of uh, Saran's humanity. For Forrester, therefore, Lord Monboddo was one of those enlightened and illustrious philosophers, but at the time many disagreed and took issue with both his research methods and his conclusions. Monboddo's firm belief that orang the orangutan and man were of the same species provoked a great uproar and exposed him to ridicule and satire. A typical reaction was that of Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson, who said, quote, other people have strange notions, but they conceal them. If they have tails, they hide them. But Monboddo is as jealous of his tail as a squirrel, end of quote. Monboddo was also concerned with the relationship between man and language, claiming that language is a habit acquired following the development of social structures and the need to communicate. He considered that the orangutan is therefore man at a very early stage mainly lacking language, but with the potential to rectify this. And Peacock was not the only satirist of the period to take advantage of the possibilities offered by this notion. Dr. William Lawrence, respected physician and friend of Percy and Mary Shelley, later joined the debate about the relationship between men and simians, specifically orangutans. In his lectures on physiology, zoology, and the natural history of man, he firmly rejected Monboddo's assertions. No doubt Forrester would have included Lawrence, like Buffon, in the category of presumptuous naturalists for refusing Sir Aran the honour of humanity, and Sir Telegraph would have cited Lawrence in support of his own views about the orangutan's separate status. But it's a further indication of the erosion of the boundaries between humans and animals in the period that Lawrence includes man in his lectures on natural history. Peacock later wrote that he had, quote, condensed Lord Monboddo's views of the humanity of the orangutan into the character of Sir Aran Oton, end of quote, 
and this is evident from the text. So Aram emerges fully formed from a thicket of footnotes. The footnote in 18th century literature was both a popular literary device and a source of satirical pleasure. And Peacock makes the most of it here, using it to play with the relationship between text and paratext. He constructs Sir Aran from multiple third party quotes and at the same time draws attention to the ridiculousness of the premise. One quick example, according to Forrester, quote, Mr. Oran had long before shown a taste for music and with some little instruction from a Marine officer in the tornado, that's the ship that had brought him to England, had become a proficient on the flute and French horn. And the accompanying note from Monbodo records of another orangutan. He has the capacity of being a musician and has actually learned to play upon the pipe and harp, a fact attested not by a common traveler, but by a man of science. Mr. Mr. Piresk, and who relates it, not as hearsay, but as a fact consistent with his own knowledge. This footnote also spills over into the next page, not surprisingly. Footnotes such as this appear to support Forrester's belief in the orangutan's humanity by explicitly connecting his appearance and behaviour with contemporary anthropological and scientific theories about the origins of humans and their close connections with other primates. However, this is undermined and satirized by Peacock's selection of extracts, which reveal the dubious basis of Monbodo's claims. Mr. Piresque was indeed a respected French natural philosopher of the 17th century, but his description of the orangutan's musical prowess was itself a traveler's tale related to him by a third party. So what is the reader to make of all this? I suggest that familiar as they might have been with encountering natural history, either through reading Buffon or in the pages of a novel, and with dealing with footnotes apparently designed to add scholarly rigor and to support the veracity of the text, in Melincourt they find something different. The footnotes and the instability of their sources tease the reader, make them uneasy as to the links between fact and fiction, and indicates the folly of relying simple-mindedly on even the most reputable of authorities. Peacock represents natural history as contested, possibly anecdotal and unreliable, subject to challenge and mired in confusion. Thank you.